Hello, this is Sean Lacey of Lacey Maths and Stats Consultancy and in this video I'm going to give a brief overview of the main points relating to hypotheses, level of significance and p-values when doing a statistical test. Along with the three points I'm also going to discuss the idea of types of error that you can encounter and the apex size. So when doing a hypothesis test Essentially, what, what you're doing is you're testing a claim. That's what a hypothesis is. A, a hypothesis is actually a claim. And whenever you think of making a claim, there's always going to be the, that, the claim and then there's going to be the opposite. So, for example, I could say this room is hot and then the opposite will be this room is not hot. I could make a claim to say, look, the treatment works. And then the opposite could be the treatment does not work. So what that means to us in statistics is that whenever we're doing a hypothesis test, whenever we're testing a claim, that there's always going to be two sides to the claim. And so what that means to us then is that there's actually going to be two hypotheses. And what we do in statistics is we call one of them the null hypothesis and we call the other the alternative hypothesis. Now what's going to be important for us then is that when we're setting up our hypotheses is that we're consistent to what we call an actual null hypothesis and by default what we would call an alternative hypothesis. So there has to be kind of, uh, I suppose, rules that we abide by when we're setting up our, our, our hypothesis. And the rules that we abide by is something that I just highlight here in this kind of box is that your null hypothesis must contain a condition of equality. That is the rule that we have. So a condition of equality I, in the, the box there, I state that we have three conditions of equality. So we have an equals, we have a less than or equal to, and we have a greater than or equal to. Now, whenever somebody makes a claim, it's very rare that a person would make the claim of equals. What the more often than not, the wording that would be used instead of using the word equals will be no difference. For example, there could be a claim that there is no difference between the placebo and treatment group. That would claim would be a null hypothesis because it involves a condition of equality, because no difference implies equals. Also, a claim could use the words the same, the same would also be mapped to the symbol of equals. Less than or equal to then, this is where you'd look at maybe you'd have a, a wording, a claim that would involve the word at most. Greater than or equal to is where you'd have a claim that could involve the word at least. And if, if you have a claim, no matter what the context is, if the claim involves a condition of equality, well then that means the claim has to be the null hypothesis. And then by default, the opposite then will be the alternative hypothesis. So if a claim is made and there is no condition of equality, well then that claim would have to be an alternative hypothesis. So we have three conditions, I suppose, of non-equality, which would be not equal to, greater than, or less than. Okay, so if a claim is made and either one of those words are mentioned in the claim, well then the claim would be an alternative hypothesis. Again, the symbol not equals, it, it, it's the correct symbol to use, I suppose. It's very rare that we make a claim and that we might say not equals. Instead of, instead of saying not equals, what kind of would be a more kind of a user-friendly language to, to use would be a difference. If, there, if you're testing a claim that a difference exists, as in that there's a difference between placebo and treatment with whatever a measurement that she is, well then that claim is going to be an alternative hypothesis because a difference implies not equals and not equals is not a condition of equality, so it has to be an alternative hypothesis. Now, it's quite important to us that we set up our hypotheses correctly because when we go off and do a statistical test and we kind of go through all the rigor of the various checking for the assumptions, doing the test, interpreting it, and so on like that, essentially our conclusion in a very kind of in a statistical mindset will be to either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So you can see here that, that that's what I'm kind of saying. Uh, on this point. So in statistics, our conclusion will be to reject a null hypothesis or fail to reject. Now, I'd always say to researchers, look, it's not, it's never that you'd kind of be saying it like that. That's something that you'd have kind of in your head. It's obviously that it's quite important that when you're reporting back your results, that you're reporting it back in context. You wouldn't go off to an employer, uh, an employer and kind of say, yes, I did that analysis that you asked me to do. We're going to reject the null hypothesis. That's not something that would make sense. So we'd always have to report back, well, what does reject the null hypothesis mean or what does fail to reject the null hypothesis mean in context? But in a kind of our statistical mindset, that's actually how we would look at drawing our conclusions. Now, what this means to us is it is very important for us to have clearly stated and have correctly stated the actual null hypothesis and that we're not mixing that up. 
because our conclusion would be to reject the null hypothesis or to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And it can often seem strange that you use the word fail to reject the null hypothesis. Why don't we use the word accept the null hypothesis? And when we're doing a statistical test, we're not interested in accepting the null hypothesis. Often the analogy that will be used when you're thinking of rejecting or failing to reject would be the whole courtroom drama kind of situation where a lead juror might would stand up at the end of a trial and would give the verdict. And the lead juror would stand up and could say guilty. Guilty is what we would map to kind of saying sim something similar as rejecting the null hypothesis. Or the lead juror would stand up and say not guilty. What does not guilty mean? Well, not guilty could mean one of two things. Not guilty could mean that the person is innocent. Equally, not guilty could mean that you feel that the person is guilty, but not enough evidence was brought forward to say that the person was guilty without reasonable doubt. So based on the evidence provided, you'd have to say not guilty. That the idea of not guilty then will be mapped to us saying fail to reject the null hypothesis in statistics. What could fail to reject the null hypothesis mean? Fail to reject the null hypothesis could mean that the null hypothesis is correct, but equally it could mean that you feel that the null hypothesis is incorrect, that you want to reject it, but you don't have enough uh, information to reject it, as in essentially your sample size isn't big enough to reject the null hypothesis. So what you, that would mean is at the moment you fail to reject, but you might go off and actually gather more data and look to then, and then repeat your analysis, which at which point then you could end up rejecting the null hypothesis. Going off and gathering more data, as how much more data would you might need? That's where you go down the route of maybe a, a using a power analysis then in that case. Okay, so I suppose when we come back to this bit though, there's just the wordings as used here, reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. They are going to be our conclusions. Okay, when we do a hypothesis test, it's going to be one of those will be our conclusions. Obviously, again, that's in a very much the statistical mindset. And unfortunately, anytime we, that we make a conclusion, there's always a chance of us being wrong. We could reject the null hypothesis and it'd be wrong. We could fail to reject the null hypothesis and it'd be wrong. So that what that means to us in statistics is there's always going to be two potential errors. So, and this is where we come up with this idea of very creative, a type one error and a type two error. A type one error is where you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. So it's the mistake of rejecting a null hypothesis when it is true. If we think of the whole courtroom drama idea, the, uh, if we're thinking of trying to map it to that, well, what that will mean is that will be the same thing as uh, accusing, uh, so, sorry, I'm just looking at the words here, accused are found guilty when in fact they should be innocent. Okay, so it's where you're looking, where you'd send an innocent person to jail. That's what it would be a type one error. It's where you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. There's always a chance of making a type 1 error. Uh, what we do in statistics is we set, look, what is our tolerance for making a type 1 error? That's what we look at. And then that leads into the level of significance, which is going to be our next slide. So I'm going to come back to that. And that's what that symbol alpha means as well in that first bullet point. In the second bullet point where we're talking about type 2 error, type 2 error is where you incorrectly fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we, where you're wrong when you fail to reject the null hypothesis. What that would relate to is where you say somebody's innocent, but in fact, they're actually guilty. Okay, and that's not something that you want to do either. And what if you basically, if you say somebody's innocent, then in fact, they're guilty. Well, in the kind of statistical world, what you've done is you've made a type two error in that case. The, I suppose the tolerance that you would allow yourself to make a type two error, the symbol that we would use that and the probability that we would align with that would be beta. This is going down the route then of looking at the idea of a statistical power. When you think of beta and you look at look at one minus beta would be your statistical power. Um, that would, would be something that I, I'll discuss in, in a future video. But I suppose at the moment, what I'm just going to leave it as a type one error is where you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. A type two error is where you incorrectly fail to reject the null hypothesis. So in statistics, again, if we think back to our conclusions, what will our conclusion be? Our conclusion will either be to reject the null hypothesis or to fail to reject the null hypothesis. When we make either one of those conclusions, there's a chance of us being wrong. So what we do then is we kind of, I suppose, prioritize one over the other. Like what, which do we most want to avoid? And what we most want to avoid is we most want to avoid sending an innocent person to jail. That is our main thing, that we want to avoid that, okay? So what we prioritize, and it's not that we're kind of ignore the other one, but what we prioritize is a, uh, making a type one error. We want to avoid making a type one error. So to I suppose when you think of making a type one error and trying to avoid it, 
what you do then in before you uh, I suppose do your statistical testing is you set a tolerance for making a type 1 error and the tolerance for making a type 1 error is this thing called your level of significance so you'd often read uh, in journals where uh, I suppose authors would say look all statistical inference was carried out using a 5% level of significance and what the authors are saying in that case is that their tolerance that they set out to make a type 1 error was 5% and it's quite traditional that the level of significance would be 5% that is the, quite the norm but I suppose it's just worth highlighting that if that's not a number that is set in stone that can vary depending on the context it can vary depending on the discipline it, it's not uncommon in some disciplines that the level of significance could be 10% it's not uncommon in other disciplines that the level of significance could be 1%. It really varies depending on look, what happens if you're actually wrong. Traditionally, and the majority of the time that I'm involved in studies, we do work off a 5% level of significance, but it's just important to know look, that that's not a number set in stone. It's a number that can vary depending on the context, depending on the discipline. And what that means then for us, I suppose, is or where, that, where that comes into play is when we do a statistical test, now the statistical test could be done maybe in Excel, could be done in SPSS or Studio, Python, SAS. There's loads of places to do a statistical test. When you do uh, do a statistical test, or maybe you might even do it more manually. When you do a statistical test, essentially what you'll end up with is you end up with this p-value at the end. And what you do then is you compare this p-value to your level of significance. If the p-value is less than or equal to your level of significance, then you will reject the null hypothesis, which means you have a statistically significant result. If your p-value is greater than your level of significance, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means you have a statistically insignificant result. Now, statistically significant result is obviously quite a statsy way of saying it. Ultimately, and this is something I'm going to return to in two slides time as well, ultimately having a statistically significant result, what that means is whatever you're measuring, which is often called an effect, so you're measuring a difference between something or the relationship between things, that's often called an effect. But essentially, when you have a statistically significant result or a statistically significant effect that means what you've observed is reliable okay so a statistically significant result ultimately is telling you that your result is reliable and that's not going to be something that's important that we're going to return to there in two slides time a statistically insignificant result i wouldn't go off and say oh that means the result that we have or we've obtained will be unreliable i wouldn't go say that because that kind of alludes to look you might have made some uh, mistake maybe in your data collection Often when you have a statistically insignificant result, how you would phrase that kind of in more layman's terms would be that the difference that you've observed or more so the effect that you've observed eh, occurred due to chance. Okay, that's what a statistically insignificant result would actually mean. Okay, and I suppose it's just with the, uh, those last two bullet points, I suppose the, the, uh, they never change. I suppose essentially that if your p-value is less than or equal to your level of significance, you reject the null hypothesis. You have a statistically significant result, you have a reliable result. If the p-value is greater than your level of significance, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means you have a statistically insignificant result, which means that your result occurred due to chance. What's important to maybe highlight then is, look, how do we interpret, kind of look, what is a p-value, I suppose, essentially? Because we know what the alpha is. That alpha is the level of significance, which is basically the tolerance that we're allowing ourselves to make a type 1 error. That's what the alpha is. But I suppose, what is a p-value? Often it can, some people would make, sometimes it's made the mistake that a p-value is your actual probability of making a type 1 error and uh, that would be incorrect, okay, that's not what a p-value is. So if we look at this slide here, I'm just going to go down to the bottom part of it, which is where I'm purposely using kind of poor English here, what is a p-value not? So it's just more to highlight look, that this is not what a p-value is. A p-value is not your mistake of making a type 1 error, okay? The p-value is not the actual probability of making type 1 error. That's not what a p-value is, okay? And it's, it's a common mistake that will be made and it's just something that's worth kind of highlighting here. And I think maybe the when you when I move up the slide and look at the other five bullet points, these are just different ways of nearly saying the same thing. And I, I think often I would find that this can be nearly just a point of reference to kind of return to, return back to if you're maybe at the early stage of your journey of using statistical, uh, doing statistical, do, doing statistics and doing statistic, statistical tests to what actually a p-value is. I think that maybe these five points, which are kind of all kind of nearly saying the same thing, are uh, a good way, maybe a good reference point to what a p-value actually is. Okay, so a p-value. I won't read out all of them, but I suppose I'll, I'll summarize them here. A p-value tells you how compatible, or measures, not tells you, measures how compatible your data is with the null hypothesis. 
okay? It's basically looking at your observed effect, how likely your observed effect. Now, the wording effect there that you can see that I'm using here, the wording of effect is but what are you measuring? Are you measuring a difference? Are you measuring a relationship? That's how we kind of, I suppose, uh, encompass it is in this word called an effect. And what a p-value tells you is how likely your observed effect from your sample data is if the null hypothesis is true. The next two bullet points is if your p-value is high. So if you have a high p-value, now what high is is in relation to your level of significance. If you have a high p-value, that's telling you that your data is aligned with the null hypothesis, with the true null. If your p-value is low, again, low is in relation to your level of significance, that is telling you your data is not aligned with the true null hypothesis. Uh, the last one I think is a nice maybe way of summarizing it is a low p-value, again, low is in relation to your level of significance, suggests that your sample uh, provides enough evidence that you can reject the null hypothesis, that ultimately that your observed effect is reliable. Now, I suppose why I like kind of maybe stating these and stating, I suppose, nearly the same thing, stating it in different ways is, just to kind of highlight that in those five points that we see there, the null hypothesis is always mentioned. Okay, so basically that's what the p-value is. The p-value maps back to your null hypothesis. Okay, and how much it is aligned or not aligned with the null hypothesis, as in your data, how much your data is aligned or not aligned with the null hypothesis. The last thing maybe just to finish up with here is, and I suppose I mentioned the word significant a lot there now in the last couple of minutes, what is significant okay so when a statistic is significant and this is something that's quite important to be aware of it's ultimately telling you that your result is reliable that's what it's telling you 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 have a reliable result just because we'll say you carry out a test and you get a p-value of 0 0.01 and you do a second test and you get a p-value of 0 0.02 the p-value that gives you a 0 0.02 is not necessarily a worse result or the other way of saying it the lower p-value is not necessarily a better result it could be but that's not necessarily the case, okay? A p-value, I suppose, essentially does not tell you how good your result is. And that's what I'm really trying to capture here in this slide, that that's not what a p-value tells you. A p-value does not tell you how good your result is. It does not tell you how important it is or anything like that. A p-value, if it's low, basically tells you, tells you that your result is reliable. And that's obviously a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's essentially what it is. And it's just to be aware of that's what a p-value actually is telling you. If you want to know how good your result is, which is where you're looking at measuring the strength of the result. Now, the result, again, would be your essentially it's your effect, the strength of your effect, which is leading into this wording that I have here called the effect size, which is the title to the slide as well. It's where you're looking at, well, how good of a difference you actually have, how good of a relationship do you actually have? And the effect size is what, uh, I suppose, quantifies this. Uh, there's different effect size formulas out there. It depends on what statistical test you have. You have Cohen's D, you have Cohen's F, you have partial eta squared, you have eta squared, you have your correlation coefficient. So there's numerous effect size formulas out there and that's why I just don't put them up in the slide here because there's numerous formulas out there and hence there's numerous kind of classifications to what, any, uh, to I suppose, quantifying your effect. Essentially, it's often common that you'd either say that your effect will be negligible it will be small, medium, or large. They're kind of very, the general ways of classifying effect size. And I suppose this slide here is not exhaustive of look what an effect size is. I suppose the purpose of this slide is mainly just to highlight that a p-value tells you that your result is reliable. It does not tell you how good your result is. If you want to know how good your result is, then you need to go a step further and you need to measure this, carry out this statistic or calculate this statistic called an effect size. And that could be just something that could be uh, worth reading up on. Okay, and look, that, that kind of brings it to the end to, to this video. This video was just, I suppose, the focus of it was to provide a, a brief overview of the main points relating to uh, statistical tests. So I just try to focus on the hypotheses, your types of error that you can encounter, your level of significance leading into the p-value, and then the idea of an effect size and the importance of an effect size. Um, hope you find this video uh, good. Uh, if you did, like everything on YouTube, it would be great if you shared or liked it or you could subscribe to the channel and you'll get the updates of when the, the next videos are, are appearing. But as, I suppose for now, uh, thanks very much for listening and all the best.